let's talk about orbital anatomy. So first, here's a picture of a lateral view of the face with the eyelid closed. The abicularis oculi muscle, a muscle of facial expression, is a sphincter muscle. It's a circular muscle that surrounds the orbit and the eyelid, or palpebrae. It's innervated by the facial nerve proper, a cranial nerve number seven, the same nerve that innervates your platysma muscle, and its function is to close your eye tight. So there it says a dotted line that shows the palpable portion, the portion that's surrounding your eyelid, and then what we're going to do is take a cross section through that area, and that's what we're looking at now. Not a cross section, pardon me, a sagittal section. Here we have a sagittal section through the eyelids, and you can see the top and the bottom of the orbicularis oculi muscles. On the inside, there are two muscles that help keep your eyelid up. The first one is called the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. Levator to elevate, palpebrae for eyelid, and superioris upper eyelid. It's the one that's shown in red, the muscle, and the yellow is its tendon, and that's innervated by the oculomotor nerve. It keeps your eyelid up. The green one below, the superior tarsal muscle, is smooth muscle and it is innervated by sympathetics from the T1 spinal cord level. So these are all sympathetics that come up the cervical sympathetic chain and then hug arteries and follow all the way up into the head and will innervate this muscle also to keep the eyelid open. You think of a sympathetic reaction, you want as much light getting into your eye as possible, so it helps keep your eyelid up. If you knock out either one of these, the oculomotor nerve 3 or sympathetics coming up to the head, it results in a droopy eyelid. That's called ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. Now, how do you get sympathetics up there? Well, here we've got on your left a sympathetic chain shown in yellow, and red is the carotid uh, artery, specifically internal carotid artery. On the right, we see the spinal cord. There's the lateral horn of T1, and that preganglionic sympathetics ascend up the chain, and then synapse in the superior cervical ganglion, and a postganglionic sympathetic will hug the internal carotid artery and follow the arteries up to the eye and innervate that superior tarsal muscle. The lacrimal apparatus is a, the lacrimal gland in the superior lateral portion of the orbit. Its function is to make tears, and it has tears that drain down in the eye and then drain through to the superior and inferior puncta and down the lacrimal sac into the nasal cavity. And those tears, their function is to wash the eye, to keep it moist, to stop it from drying out, and also immune properties to help fight infection. It drains down that lacrimal duct through that nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity. And that lacrimal gland is innervated by the facial nerve. The greater petrosal branch is what's going to cause you to cry. So here we show that innervation. Well, there's our internal acoustic meatus and the greater petrosal hiatus where the facial nerve courses. And there's a, something called the pterygopalatine ganglion. Well, there's the pathway of the greater petrosal nerve courses along from the facial nerve through the internal acoustic meatus, through the greater petrosal hiatus, synapses in the pterygopalatine ganglion, and then hitchhikes on V2 up to V1 and innervates that lacrimal gland. Greater petrosal nerve. Okay, V2 in gray and V1 in gray, that's showing where this greater, uh, these parasympathetics from 7 hitchhike on cranial nerve 5 to get to their destination. Now, what are the layers of the eyeball? There's three layers, the sclera uh, with cornea, the choroid layer, and the retina. Well, the sclera, even though this is shown in pink, it's actually the white of the eye, like the photograph we see on the left. It's the white of the eye. It's dense fibrous connective tissue. And then the, and that's dense because that's where your extraocular muscles attach, like superior rectus and, and inferior oblique. The cornea is this transparent portion of the front of the sclera that's anterior to the iris, or that blue part of this picture in the eye. And the function of this cornea is to refract incoming light to help focus light along with the lens onto the retina. The cornea has innervation from cranial nerve V1, the trigeminal nerve. So if you, those who go to put on your contacts, the reason why you know that you're touching your eye, that's the sensory limb of, of, this, um, of the cornea, the sensory innervation from cranial nerve V-1. The second layer is called the choroid layer, and it's shown in blue in this illustration. And it's got a lot of blood vessels, and anteriorly, a portion of this is a bunch of smooth muscles called the ciliary muscles. And that circular muscle is attached to the lens in turquoise by the suspensory ligaments in yellow. And the contraction and 
uh, and relaxation of those ciliary muscles changes the tension of suspensory ligaments, which change the shape of the lens. The iris is, is in the most anterior portion of this choroid layer, which is comprised of pupillary sphincter and dilator muscles that change the diameter of the pupil to allow more or less light in. So here we have a sagittal section. In orange are the ciliary muscles that are relaxed. The suspensory ligaments are taut. The lens is flat. But when you innervate, and so what happens is these lights coming from a far distance, like you're sitting in your chair looking at a teacher at the front of the room, the light travels in parallel. There's some refraction on the cornea and then some uh, other refraction uh, that comes from the lens that goes on to the retina. But it needs less refraction because the light is already coming in parallel from a far distance. Now, if you innervate those ciliary muscles, then what happens is they contract, and as they contract, as any sphincter muscle, they'll shorten the diameter between them. This causes, ciliary muscle contraction causes the suspensory ligaments to become loose, and the lens goes to its more natural oval shape. This occurs when you look down at your keyboard. Now the light's coming from a pinpoint surface and it needs more refraction to go to the lens. So light traveling from a point very close, like a book, needs more refraction to focus on the retina. Um, that's innervated, so the ciliary muscles are innervated by cranial nerve 3, parasympathetic innervation, cranial nerve 3. In this section through, we now look at the pupil. The sphincter pupillae muscle is shown in green. This muscle makes the pupil diameter smaller, like that, from here to here. Restricts the amount of light that comes in, like taking your pen light and shining it in a patient's eye. So there we've got our pupil and the sphincter pupillae muscle blinking. So the accessory ocular motor nucleus, which you don't, I don't care if you remember or not, is the origin of this parasympathetic pathway. And it sends a preganglionic parasympathetic nerve along with cranial nerve 3 to synapse in the ciliary ganglion, a peripheral ganglion. Then postganglionic parasympathetics travel along cranial nerve 3 to cause the sphincter pupillae muscle to contract or to constrict the pupil. There's also the pupillary dilator muscle, which is smooth muscle also in the iris, that its function is to dilate the pupil, or sympathetic, because you want as much light coming in as possible in a sympathetic reaction. And so here we have in red that internal carotid artery, and in blue there is the sympathetics that just jump and hitchhike on whatever nerves possible and get to the dilator pupillary muscles in red, and also the superior tarsal muscles in red, in orange, pardon me, that help keep the eyelid up. So what results when sympathetics to the head is interrupted? Well, Horner syndrome, a lack of sympathetic innervation to the head. Symptoms, ptosis, anhydrosis, meiosis. What does that mean? Well, first, ptosis, the eyelid is droopy on the Horner syndrome side. Anhydrosis, it becomes flush because now all those arteries completely lose their tone and so blood flushes to the surface. Um, then anhydrosis, for lack of sweating, and meiosis, the pupil diameter gets smaller because you've knocked out sympathetics and the parasympathetics take over.